different objectives to create uh, predictable objectives. So, uh, okay, so we have uh, guests, uh, deaf doctors from uh, Bucharest. We have doctors from Poland, Spain, Hello. India, Hello. Sweden, uh, Malaysia, Albania, Morocco, uh, Yemen, India. The, uh, yeah, doctors from France, from Manila, from Rizal, from Iraq, from Serbia, from Agusan del Norte, uh, from Tayabas, Belgrade, Portugal, Cambodia, Netherlands, Pampanga, Botswana, Qatar, from Quezon City, from Romania, from Myanmar, from Turkey, Germany, Desmarinas, Cavite, and I think it's all coming in. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to have you with us tonight, uh, today, for this uh, webinar. So I'm going to go shift slides. So before we uh, before we go on to the main topic, uh, we're going to have two more webinars this week. Uh, the first one will be this Saturday uh, morning, 10 a.m. Uh, it's the episode, second episode of the COVID-19 Dental FAQs with Dr. Uh, Jet Po and Dr. RJ Dula. It's going to be moderated with Dr. Paolo Manzano. We've had uh, we've got interesting questions last Saturday and. Uh, we hope we hope you guys join us again for another uh, for another uh, loaded session on Saturday and uh, following on s Saturday as well uh, at 7 p.m. in the evening Manila Standard Time uh, we're going to have episode four of Botched uh, this is this is with Dr. Pao and Dr. Adid Benogopal uh, they will discuss more uh, more interesting cases for you so hope you uh join hope you join them okay so i think we're ready to start so disclaimer a little disclaimer before we uh before we go on uh bio and all and any of its speakers and guest speakers have no financial interests and arrangements or affiliations with any product or company which could be perceived as having real or apparent conflict of interest in the context of the subject of any of our webinars or lectures. All our speakers and guest speakers are not accepting any honorarium fees or gifts and are selflessly voluntary. All published webinars are free and are used only to help dentists cope with the pandemic and quality science-based webinars. So let me add on to this. And uh, playbacks are available. This lecture is going to be available in playback. Botched, botched episode 2, botched episode 3, as well as the first episode of COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID se seminar is all available in playback. You just have to go to uh, bioorthodontics, uh, bioorthodontics Facebook page and uh, you just have to follow the thread. All right. So let's start. So this topic is uh, something that is really, uh, really captured my interest and really close to me. And uh, this one is making the most predictable treatment outcomes. Uh, we have we have a lot of rental parameters that is available now in the market and. Uh, I will, uh, I will focus on this one parameter that will be very, very useful for you guys if you want to have a good diagnosis and a predictable treatment plan. So let me start off with a question. What makes a predictable treatment outcome? Right? So a predictable treatment outcome for you and for me is it's a good diagnosis that is coupled by a good treatment delivery. And sometimes 
we have cases that puts us in the crossroads uh, in diagnosis something is unclear on uh, when we are reviewing our diagnostic parameters something is quite unclear and it it gives us it gives us a very blurred uh, a very blurred diagnosis sometimes a very blurred uh, objectives and a blurred plan as well Let me just pause for a while. Check this. Okay. Just so let me check first my stream. I'm having quite uh, I'm having a little difficulty with this stream, so let me check it for a while, sorry. Check this. Sorry, everyone. Uh, I'm checking the signal of this team so that we can get the best reception for this lecture. Okay. Let's go to the internet. The iPad. The iPad. The iPad. Ito na lang. Ito na lang. Ito na Okay, so I think we can continue now. Uh, good. Yeah, sorry for that little glitch. And sometimes crossroads and diagnosis will give us a misdiagnosis because uh, when we're diagnosing cases, we are unsure. There are some blurred parts of it. And it turns out sometimes we misdiagnose. When we misdiagnose, it, it, spell, uh, it could spell disaster in our treatment plan and delivery and can give us major problems in treatment. So I'm going to share to you, I'm going to share to you some of my cases that, uh, that, uh, that put me on the crossroads and how did we find solutions on these cases. So right here. Uh, so the first case is this one. So this patient is the uh, this patient is originally an orthodontic case, and as part of our uh, comprehensive treatment plan, removal of the third molar should be done. And as you can see here, we have a panoramic, which is a standard uh, which is a standard protocol if we are if we are to diagnose our uh, impacted third molars. And uh, and if we're going to diagnose this one, is uh, we're going to start off with the horizontal 4.8. So we can clearly see that the 4.8 is horizontal, but we still have some. We still need to establish the relationship of the nerve in relation to the tooth, as well as how many roots are there on the third molar, because that would spell that would spell the difficulty as well the complexity of the case. Now. Uh, panoramic radiographs are quite limited to this aspect uh, because of the superimpositions among the roots and the tooth to the nerve. And if we are not experienced enough to spot these, we will always have doubts in our approach when we discuss our plans to our patients and even during surgery. So, with the relationship of the nerve, we have here two aspects that could superimpose. We have your... Uh, we have your third molars and of course your nerve and we are unsure just by looking at the tooth radiograph if we are not experienced enough or if we have doubts on the position of your of your uh, nerve in relation to your tooth we are unsure if this nerve is placed on the buckle of the tooth or it could be on the lingual worst case scenario it could be dead on the middle so 
with this with these things that we have to consider plus the plus the number of routes available on these third molars, we are put on a diagnostic crossroads. Um, different positions of the nerve, of course, we have different management for each. We have different uh, levels of care when we try to manage this one. And uh, it could blur our treatment predictability. So let's look up the upper. The upper third molar is, uh, we always ask this question, is it approximating the sinus and the number of roots? And then looking at this 2D radiograph right here, we can, uh, we can just see we can just see that it's uh, it's approximating the sinus, but we are unsure of the number of roots. And it appears in this 2D radiograph, it appears to have uh, roots that are separated or uh, just two roots. So in the sinus approximation here, we know it's we know it approximates the sinus, but we want to know how close. Right, so this uh, in this aspect in this third molar uh, in this third molar diagnosis when we create our treatment plans when we discuss to our patients, sometimes uh, we have this situation where we have a blurred uh, a blurred diagnosis that gives us a blurred predictability, right? So uh, and here's another case. So in this case uh, the. RCT is done on tooth number 16. The first complaint was uh, that there was pain on tooth 16, so endodontic treatment was done. However, just a few days after this orthodontic treatment, er, uh, sorry, in this endodontic treatment, the patient returned to the clinic complaining of tenderness on that same area. So, we we used uh, we did uh, we did diagnosis on this part and. Uh, Turns out that 1.7 was positive to percussion. And of course, just by looking at the 2D radiograph and just by looking at it clinically without obvious signs, without obvious indicators, we are puzzled or we have a blurred, uh, we, have a, we have a blurred visibility on what could have caused, uh, what could have caused the pain for this too. And uh, we are now in the, in, this, in the context of crossroads. We are now in the crossroads in identifying the real reason of the pain. Uh, it happens once in a while. And speaking of once in a while, sometimes we have these kinds of patients that uh, we encounter that their chief complaints say they have an uninterrupted tooth number 2-1. And uh, when we check clinically, uh, the patient was 10 years old during this consultation. Uh, she was bullied at school because of her front teeth. And this uninterrupted incisor definitely made an impact to lower her self-esteem. So uh, this young, 10 years old, being bullied at school because of the uninterrupted 2-1 that retained 6-1. And, uh, the, well, upon consultation and check up and uh, assessment of the uh, panoramic x-ray, we initially proposed a surgical orthodontic management solution. However, since the patient and the parents, they are looking for a quick solution so that the bullying will stop. That's the urgency right there. And of course, this situation is where my hands are held behind my back and it really challenged me to look for a quick solution. And uh, this one, with all the compromises, with all the discussions that we did to our patient, uh, we finally agreed to do our best to have cosmetic restoration on tooth number 6-1. So we will do cosmetic restoration, make it look like tooth number 1-1, one, one, and uh, when the time comes, the patient has, uh, has the confidence to undergo surgery and ortho, that's the time we will manage it in the ideal way we want. So unfortunately, this treatment did not push through because the patient went to a long vacation in her province and it took her a year to return. So when, we, when she returned to our clinic, uh, they told that in, upon, uh, upon, of course, upon interview, uh, when they were in vacation, she, they went to another practice and uh, they opted for the extraction of 6-1, hoping that 2-1 will erupt. 
And in this situation, she is bullied even more because six one is gone. She has a gap there in the anterior segment and her, and her uh, self-esteem is at an all-time low. And uh, they return to our clinic and they opt for an orthosurgical solution that I've proposed to her. So they could have, uh, they now opted to the initial, uh, to the initial treatment plan that I su that we suggested to her in the first visit. And by looking at this panoramic radiograph, uh, there is a mass that obstruct the eruption of our 221. And I believe the dentist who did the extraction might have, have, might have been on that crossroads when she managed this patient. So that, could have, that could have blurred the predictability and now 21 cannot erupt because of this obstruction right here. So we need to do management. So we don't want that to happen in our case. We want to have a very predictable uh, outcome so that uh, the level of confidence of our patients in our practice and our confidence to our treatment will be approved or will be good. So those are the crossroads in diagnosis. And uh, the crossroads in diagnosis will definitely lead us to a very blurred treatment outcome which means the predictability of our outcome is not that good. It's very blurred. We are not sure. And what if there is a way for us to have a clarity and diagnosis where, uh, where we can see, where we can have a predictable outcome? And, uh, and one way, and the way we can do it is to have a parameter that is clear and that can, can satisfy our diagnostic objective and when we view our case in a different perspective. So uh, let's go to the main topic. So we talk about virtual reality. So your virtual reality means, uh, by definition, it's a computer-generated simulation of a three-dimensional image or environment that can be interacted in a seemingly real or physical way by a person using special electronic equipment. Uh, I want you guys to focus on three uh, on three terms right here. We have your computer, three-dimensional image, and can be interacted. I think in terms of dentistry, it's, it now starts to ring a bell. So when we say virtual reality, in dentistry, which is a computer, which is computer-aided approach processed in a three-dimensional image, and we can interact with it, of course, this is going to be our cone beam CT scan. And our cone beam CT scan, uh, this is a current advancement in dentistry that allows us to view our cases in a different perspective. Uh, so let's have a quick poll. And I just want to know how familiar is everyone in, with the applications of the CBCT. So I'm going to launch the poll now and I'm going to wait for your answers right here. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can post it down below on the comment sections and we'll address it on some parts of the lecture. So the poll is now out. Okay, I published the poll. So I just want to know, uh, I just want to know how familiar are you with the applications of the CBCT? So yeah, so we have, we have unf unfamiliar. We have some guests that are unfamiliar, some guests that are quite familiar. Oh, well now we're getting uh, we're getting some some of those who use CBCTs but they don't know how to manipulate it, and uh, some some people use CBCT and uh, they don't know how to manipulate. But yeah, so majority are in the zone of. Uh, dentists who are quite familiar with the applications of the CBCT and this lecture is for you okay so this lecture is for you I'm going to show you how are we going to apply C cone beam CT scan to address some limitations in our diagnosis so that we can see uh, so we can see all those uh, all those blurred areas in our diagnosis Okay, so it's good that we have guests, we have doctors who know who use CBCTs and knows how to manipulate. It's good to see. 
Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slides. Okay. So, let's talk about the evidences on accuracy of your cone beam CT scan. So, there were two studies that that uh, that concludes or that that suggests that CBCT is reliable for linear measurement of structures closely associated with dentomaxillofacial imaging. So we have here studies by, Kobe, by Dr. Kobayashi and Dr. Lescala. So I'm going to give you some details on that. And the study by Dr. Lescala is when they measured uh, they measured some points, specific points of the skull of the of the of a dry skull. And then they took a CBCT of that, and then they measured it again. So on, on this first table, these are the points that they uh, these are the points that they use as reference for the measurements. And this is one part of it. They use the lateral orbit as a landmark. And the results are quite amazing. Uh, their conclusion is that true, although CBCT images. CBCT images underestimates, meaning they have a measurement that is relatively shorter than the real subject, uh, differences are only significant for the skull base. For the skull base. But when it comes to the dental and maxillofacial region, it has a good, it's very little, it's very close in the linear measurements. Okay? So here's another, uh, here's another study by Dr. Kobayashi. This time, they used the mandible, they drilled holes on it, and they took a scan and then they measured. And they got the same conclusion. It's reliable for linear measurements when they measure the holes, compare the holes. Uh, they have almost the same results with Dr. Lascala. CBCTs, though, measure it relatively uh, a little short, around, uh, around 2 millimeters short. But uh, it's more it's more evident the discrepancy is more evident on the cranial on the uh, on the base of, on the skull rather than the dental maxillofacial maxillofacial region so with these findings the earliest uh, the earliest applications of cbct in dentistry is this one linear measurements of uh, of pathological lesions of the maxilla and linear measurements in implant planning so that those were the first applications of the CBCTs. And with continuous advancement of this technology, uh, it allows us to apply this imaging technique in more fields on, of dentistry that I will show to you later on. All, all those cases before that I have that I've shown you will we'll try uh, will look for solutions there through the CBCT. So the next issue here is uh, the next evidence on accuracy is the lower the voxel size, the better the image quality, thus the higher the accuracy. So this uh, this came from the same study by Dr. Lascala, and it's supported by uh, by studies by Sun. And uh, let's talk about voxel first, so that we can get the full uh, we can get the full uh, description of this segment. So your voxels they are the basic unit of your 3D images and your 2D they are and your 2D uses pixels as their basic unit. So how how are they different? So here is a superimposition of your CBCTs and your panoramic X-ray. So you can see your panoramic X-ray follows your CBCTs, right? And when we split them up, pixels are automatically, they are all registered on a flat surface because they deal with two-dimensional images. They all deal with the flat surface. While in 3D, since, vo since we use voxels here, your voxels, they can, go to, uh, they can go to the depths of the target. They can, capture, uh, they can capture the details as well as the orientations and the depth of the subject. Okay? And uh, when we speak of voxel size, the smaller it is, the higher the accuracy. So when this study was uh, when this study was done last uh, by two thousand four, the available voxel size of your CBCT machines were just 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 millimeters. Uh, 
and uh, when you decrease the voxel size, compare your 0.4 to 0.2, you can see significant difference in terms of the image quality. And if you have good image quality, of course, it can give us more accuracy. More accuracy. And uh, currently, currently there is, uh, sorry, uh, with the advancement of this technology, voxel sizes tend to go smaller. So uh, we have now the most common in the market is around 0 0.76, I uh, sorry, 0 0.076 millimeters, and there are CBCT machines that can give you a lower voxel size. So you can see the difference now between your 0.2 millimeter voxel size and your 0 0.076 millimeters. You can see how much surfaces got got crisp details, got good image quality, right? And uh, so when you check. When you check your uh, when you check your CBCT provider, say you want to send your patients for a CBCT scan, it's okay if you will ask how much is their voxel size, because their voxel size will determine how much how good will be the quality of your image. Remember, the smaller the, the smaller the voxel size, the better the image quality. It will give you the higher accuracy. Okay. So with this advancement, it now allows us to go deeper to the uh, to assessment in our dental structures. So this is uh, this is a scan in a 0 0.076 millimeter uh, voxel size or 76 micron voxel size and this is the region of the floor of your cavity. So when we're doing endo, right, we do access preparations. So that's where we locate the orifices. So to make our treatments more predictable by seeing our CBCT scans here, we have uh, we can already see in this area that we have three orifices. We have three orifices, and for us to be sure, we can scan down. And as we can, as we scan down, it gives us three canals. Meaning, if we perform biomechanical preparations and obturations on this case, uh, we we won't have second guesses of the existence of a fourth canal because according to your CBCTs and with that small uh, with that and with that small voxel size gave you three canals already okay so uh, this is uh, this is the good advancement of your CBCTs meaning we are now moving forward from the limited applications of your CBCTs in implant and in uh, and in complex surgery so we can almost use it we can use it uh, in cases where we need where we need an accurate view or a very clear view of the objective that we want to see so your CBCTs they are always rendered in DICOM by default so when you ask your uh, when you ask your suppliers or when you ask your service center or your diagnostic center or your clinic uh, this is the default soft this is the default format since it's uh, since it's since we need the computer to manipulate it we need DICOM to be the format and your DICOM means it's digital imaging and communications in medicine so this format is universal meaning if you send it to me from the Philippines provided it's DICOM format I can open it and I can send you that file wherever you are in the world so this is one crucial uh, this one crucial information that we need to understand when we're dealing with CBCTs the format we want it universal we want it uh, the good ad the, the advantage of this technology is that we can communicate with our colleagues not just near our practice but even if they're if we even if they're miles away from us we can still do consultations we can still do uh, discussions and uh, your DICOM format should be open on an open source DICOM viewer software so your but you know but you know some manufacturers they render their CBCT files according to their preferences like on how they prefer their interface to be manipulated uh, but I like to show you the basic perspectives or views present on every CBCT programs or set or every CBCT softwares 
that is sufficient for everyone to effectively diagnose your cases and make treatment outcomes predictable. So let's go to your perspectives. So we have your, your first perspective. The first perspective, since it's three, uh, it's three dimensional, so we are expecting three basic perspectives. The first perspective is your sagittal that moves your scan from left to right. Again, sagittal moves your scan from left to right. Okay, so if you're going to visualize a sagittal view, it seems like you are looking looking at your patient on the side view. Okay, that's sagittal, left to right. The second perspective is coronal. Coronal moves from anterior to posterior, front to back. Okay, so with this one, with this one right here, uh, it seems like we are viewing our patient anteriorly or posteriorly. So if you can look at this one, it's like we chopped the chopped the face on the coronal aspect. So we can see these kinds of images. And the third perspective to make it three-dimensional is your axial view. Your axial view moves from superior to inferior. So with this one, it allows you to view your case just like you're viewing your occlusal aspect of your cases. So we have now the three uh, basic perspectives, the sagittal, the coronal, the axial. So here's what's fun. Here's what's fun. Because this three basic perspectives is present on software A. Of course, uh, you can add the 3D view here so that you can have a visualization on how you uh, how you orient your cases on something something your uh, something to relate to when you're doing your uh, manipulation. And here is software two shows you the three basic planes and the three view and the three different view as well, and the 3D view as well. And here's uh, another software which shows you the same. And here's another software that shows the same. So regardless of what CBCT software you are handling, these three planes, these three basic perspectives should be present when you try to manipulate it. Okay. So uh, let's check if you have any questions. I would like to know if you have any questions. Let's check if we have number, uh, if you have questions. So, okay. Someone, uh, someone did PM me of a question. Okay, uh, the question was, the question was, how, uh, how, how will I know if, uh, if, how will I know if the software I am handling can open a DICOM format software? So, you have to search for, uh, we have to look for uh, software that allows, that is an open source. So, uh, there are a lot that you can download free. So a free software could be this one. It's called Blue Sky Bio. You can uh, you can download this one. This is a treatment planning software, but you can do your CBCT scans on it. Another one is Mango. Uh, Mango is a software that allows you to view any DICOM files, even medical CTs. However, it's a little limited for the 3D view. But in Mango, the only available uh, the only available perspectives are only these three. Another one that I can suggest is also Synedra. Synedra is a good uh, open source software. Uh, it gives you the three basic planes and the 3D view and its manipulation is quite easy. However, it's only available for Windows. And the last one is the one for Microsoft. Uh, the one with the tablets. There is a downloadable uh, DICOM viewer on Microsoft tablets that allows you to manipulate the CBCT scans with the use of your fingertips. It's very amazing. It's very good. However, it's uh, it's only exclusive to Microsoft users. So, uh, okay. So, what is available for Mac? Uh, for Mac, uh, Blue Sky Bio. I can recommend you guys to download Blue Sky Bio. It has updates for the Mac, but as of now, they are prioritizing, I think they're prioritizing the Windows 
uh, the Windows version more. But I think updates for the uh, Mac version is on their way. So those are the open source softwares. So you can request any DICOM file from any service center. You just, you just need an open source software to open those DICOM files. Thank you for the questions. So let's continue. So the following slides is, uh, is on how we can use the CBCTs to have a predictable outcome. So I'm going to show you how, how, we, how do we look for the objectives. So again, remember this case earlier where, uh, where we initially proposed a restoration of the 221, but it didn't carry out and the patient came back with this, uh, with this manifestation. And by default, uh, by default, following the two-dimensional uh, perspectives, what we can, uh, what we can request is a panoramic and an occlusal radiograph. That way, we can localize the location of your tooth number two one and your odontoma. So when we look at these scans now, we can we can see where our tooth number two one and we can see where our uh, where is our tooth two one. It's uh, situated on the lingual aspect, but we cannot see the odontoma. But I am not uh, I am not uh, personally I am not convinced with uh, with the with the objectives that I am setting for an occlusal radiograph. Uh, for me, occlusal radiographs are a little limited. And uh, what I can really suggest is have a CBCT taken. So this is a CBCT of the same case. This is the panoramic view of it. And you can see now the position of your tooth number 21. And you can see this mass here. And uh, it seems like, uh, it seems like, it's an odontoma, so we have to have we need to have a closer look for us to confirm, or uh, actually the best way to confirm an odontoma is during surgery when you remove it. So uh, let's uh, let's make it let's give the most uh, the most probable the most uh, the most probable uh, diagnosis for this. So remember the occlusal radiograph. The occlusal radiograph says that my uh, two, two one was situated on the palatal. If I followed through with that, uh, with that, uh, with that finding, with that diagnosis, I could have screwed up. I could have accessed it in the palatal. And by looking at the CBCT, it seems it's more convenient to view it on the labial, right? So uh, again. This uh, the previous uh, the previous suggestion still gives me a little blur, and uh, I will opt for a CBCT. So we have now a good vision of your odontoma right here. We have a good vision of your odontoma, and it clearly interferes with the eruption of your tooth number two one. So let's take a closer look. Uh, some some dentists, some clinicians, they are having a hard. Uh, they don't request CBCTs even if they need one because they they don't know how to manipulate. Okay, they don't know how to manipulate the software. They don't know. Uh, they don't know how to manipulate. And uh, I have been, and I have once been there. I know CBCTs, but I don't request CBCTs because I don't know how to manipulate. And it costs in the Philippines. It costs quite a lot. So uh, when I learned CBCT, when I learned how to use CBCTs, uh, it really changed the way I see cases. So I'm going to show you how how we uh, how I isolate. So this one. Here's how I here, here's how I isolate my uh, odontoma. So here's the software. I start first with the egg shell. I locate it. I locate it. First, since it's in the maxilla, I locate it upwards. Now I see the odontoma. I just redirect the lines, and then I reorient it to its uh, to a to a sorry to a constructed long axis. So you can see here that I can isolate, and I'm moving the slice, the sagittal slice around, just to see if there are any borders or if there are any, if there are any structures that I am missing out. And so far, this one. With this uh, radiographic appearance, it could have uh, could suggest that it's really an odontoma. So here's a uh, good isolation of the case. 
and uh, speak of densities now. So this is a 3D view. So what's good with your CBCTs is it allows you to have these filters that uh, can give you a relative density, a relative, a subjective view of your uh, bone density. So this one here, since I can see the structure that I am looking for, it can suggest that I might have a very thin bone covering this area. So I checked it in the detail. So this is the sagittal view. So it, again, it seems like we are looking the odontoma from the side. And this is the coronal view. That seem, It seems like we are looking the odontoma up front. So we can see here that uh, landmarks, so this is a cortical segment of your bone. And this one, the darker, the more lucent area is your trabecular bone or your spongy bone. And if we, can, if we will relate it on the labial aspect, what we can see here that there is uh, no bone or very thin bone covering my odontoma. So we can now relate it to my 3D scan and it can suggest this one. So why do I make sure, why do I make sure that this one will will be correlated to this one because some cbct scans they tend to produce noise just like this one just like this one here they tend to produce noise and uh, these noise these noise they tend to uh, they tend to make the scan a little bit dirty and uh, a little bit ugly so your the radiologists they tend to uh, clean it up and when they fail to clean it up, what they do is they just uh, they just manipulate the density. So if the density of the if the actual density was altered, uh, this might this will not become accurate. That's why we should we should rely on this one to confirm what we see on this aspect. Okay. So now we isolate. Uh, sorry. So this is now this during the surgery. So what you see here is the odontoma itself. Again, your CBCTs, they, uh, there is a thin or no bone because studies have shown that your CBCTs cannot fully register very thin, uh, very thin layer of bone. Okay. Uh, however, in terms of managing it, very thin layer of bone doesn't pose a big. Uh, a big disadvantage when we're treating it because just like in this one since it has a very thin bone and this is the mold uh, periosteal elevator the odontoma when they when they uh, remove the bone covering that one they just use the mold they removed it very easily so this is what we see in the cbct this is what our surgeon sees so we are not second guessing we are sure that this area is thin so it's okay it's easy. It's easy to remove. So now we let's go to the uh, and uh, sorry during the surgery. If I may go back, I would like to share to you uh, during the surgery. The surgeon removed thirteen supernumerary teeth, so it's quite a lot. Uh, it's quite a lot for obstruction, right? Okay. So. Uh, this time, I'm going to isolate my tooth number two one. So again, the same technique that I use, I start off with the HL view. I locate it. Now, that's where I that, that's where my tooth number two one, and then I place my lines there. The next thing I will do is now follow the long axis of my tooth. For anteriors, it's pretty easy. Why? Because you just have to follow the canal. And just like in this one, I just reorient this view and now we have a clear isolation of tooth number two one now you can see that the apex is not formed it's uh it's in it's in the middle of the it's, it's in the middle of uh developing the the late mid the the far end of your middle third towards the apical uh, towards the apical third so uh, we're still looking for possibilities of uh, possi orthodontic possibilities for this. So to see it uh, clearly, so I take a snapshot, snapshot of it and then now we correlate. So again, 
this is your sinus already. This is your sinus. And this is your tooth number two one. We correlate the bone density that we have on this one to this one. And uh, what we see here, what we see here is uh, a very thin covering of bone. And of course, in ortho, we are, uh, we are already considering managing it orthodontically by placing an attachment. However, uh, however, when we check the CBCDs again, this is the ANS already. This is the anterior nasal spine. It's anterior nasal spine. The position of your incisor is quite high. Uh, and during surgery, during surgery, it's uh, the lips are very tense. The patient is uh, complaining of a little bit of discomfort when they when they try to retract it, and we cannot have a very good uh, a very a very good control on the fluids on the blood, and uh, that's why we did not opt for attachment of the bracket. So with this one. Uh, it's still predictable in a sense that we know that there is a thin layer of bone covering it and uh, they just uh, they just open it up, uh, remove some bone so that we can allow it to passively erupt. So with that, with those things, we can now look for possibilities of managing it orthodontically since we cannot place uh, we cannot place an attachment on that uh, on that location on that high location so uh, a study by the costa and Xiang, when i uh, when we look for possibilities because we now see a full picture of the patient it seems like it's our patient just without the skin and just without the gums right so it's our patient in it's uh in its bone form and it's like virtual reality so we have here the case. So the approach is that since the root is uh, on that on that situation in its development stage, it still has some uh, it still has some uh, it still has some force to propel itself out into occlusion. So what we're going to do is we're going to place brackets and create space to uh, we, we open up a space for that two one to go out. So ideally, this should happen. So when the propulsion, when when the when the propulsion, the force to propel the tooth to erupt is uh, exhausted, that's the time we will place the uh, fixed attachment, and then we pull it down. So you see the difference in managing it. It gives us a very clear picture of our case and it gives us a very clear uh, clear picture on how we should approach it. Uh, we should be on the crossroads when we are deciding on the treatment possibilities, on the treatment plan uh, because it gives us a lot of room, a lot of options for the patient to decide. If we have the cro crossroads, if we are on the diagnostic crossroads, uh, it's going to give us a hard time because it uh, diagnostic crossroads gives us a, a, a whole lot of variety of treatment plans and a whole a whole lot of level of uncertainty. So uh, this one is uh, this this one is a very nice application of the scan. So now we pull it down. So uh, I think let's check for questions before I proceed to the next case. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think we don't have questions. So let's proceed. So this is the next case. Uh, this case is uh, this case is it's more on the uh, lower incisors, and. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of torquing this one, and uh, because of the position of this one, uh, position of this one. So we did the diagnostic parameters, and we came up for, uh, and I came, and we came up with a solution to torque this one, because in the measurement of the set, it's not good. 
So when you say superimpositions, it's when your adjacent teeth or your adjacent structures covers up, covers up the uh, covers up the area that you are uh, covers up the area that you are managing. So this is the CBCT scan, and uh, as you can see here, a very good application of CBCTs in ortho is on the alveolar boundaries. Because you will know, you can now uh, you can now see their decisions on forking it. So this is the this is the image of the incisor in relation to the uh, mandible. So now we're looking at some possibilities on how to fork it out, to fork the tube. So is it possible? So this is a treatment planning software. So your CBCTs is not just for diagnosis. We can also use it for treatment planning. So this one, I just placed uh, sent a, a, an incisor to simulate the position, the initial position of this incisor. And as you can see on the registration on the three-dimensional image, you can see this small root tip going out. So uh, torque should be done to avoid further damage. So to simulate how can we do the torque it is like this one. So I use the software. It's easy. You just have to torque it. And as you can see, I'm going to uh, play it back. If I play it back, what you will see here is this. You don't see now the, the root the root, uh, the root being prominent on this area because we changed the torque. So torquing is a possibility on this patient, and your CBCTs can help you on, uh, on giving you a visual treatment objective, and that if you present this to your patient, of course, uh, confidence, your confidence, and their confidence on the treatment plan that you are proposing, on the treatment, the treatment path you are going. Uh, will be uh, will be good. So your uh, in ortho in ortho we have this uh, di radiographic diagnostic parameters, right? So we have your panoramic and your lateral self. They always go hand in hand. And in some cases, we have uh, we request a frontal self uh, for some diagnostic objectives that we want to see, right? So we request so we request uh, we request radiographs dep depending on the diagnostic objectives that we want to achieve, and with these three radiographs, and because of superimpositions of the buccal, the lingual bones, and the tooth itself, this will be fairly limited in seeing these kinds of cases when you have uh, fenestrations, right? So uh, CBCTs. CBCTs they eliminate the they eliminate the factor of superimposition. So now you can see here that you are losing a bone on this area, and uh, of course this will definitely have a uh, have an impact in your retention and your stability. So again, this is a subjective view. Let's try to look at it on the objective view. So this is another view. But it's not. Uh, it's 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 based on the basic view. This is what we call a cross section view. So your cross section view is just a convenient combination of your sagittal and your coronal. So right now we are seeing here is the sag is the sagittal. It's a coronal view. So you have it here, and when we approach the anteriors, it becomes your uh, sagittal. So you can see here that the bone is not. Uh, is not correlating with the tooth, meaning this is uh, we can the parallel between the three D view and the cross section view is uh, is uh, good. Okay, you can see here that uh, there is alveolar resorption on the on the on the labial on the facial segment. So that's how we can check. Uh, bone resorptions, especially on the buccal lingual or the facial lingual or facial palatal region.
So let's go to the next case. And uh, again, this is the first, this is one of the first cases I've seen. And uh, we want to know the cause of the pain of this tooth. So we are looking at the possibility that, uh, sorry, and we are looking at eliminating of removing the buccal roots. We just want to see the palatal roots. And that's superimposition in the two-dimensional perspective. Your buccal roots, they superimpose your palatal, uh, your palatal roots, uh, therefore giving you a very blurred vision on that area. And uh, conventional two-dimensional techniques uh, recommends that we use a initial tube shift technique or we use slab for us to localize the palatal root. And, uh, and an easier way to do this is if we use a CBCT. So your CBCTs, I'm going to show you now how, how do we uh, isolate a specific root. Okay? So it's possible in the CBCTs because uh, there is no superimposition on this area. So you have, this is a different software. So uh, I scan first. Of course, I go to the upper since I'm looking for at the upper. And then I go to my target tooth, whether it's on the left or it's on the right. And then I place my, uh, I place this one and follow the long axis again. I go to the canal and then I follow the long axis of that tooth. That way, we can isolate that root specifically. Alright? So that's how we isolate. So the tip there is when you locate for your tooth, you locate first where is the arch, and then uh, you go to the canal, and then you manipulate it following its long axis, and you will be good. You can have a good isolation. So this is the isolation of that case. So you can see here that there is a radio, uh, a re, sorry, a periapical pathosis on this area. And what could have caused this? Uh, your CBCT, since the uh, since the voxel size is smaller, it can go to a more detailed uh, area. And you can see here that a possible cause and a more likely cause of this uh, of this lesion right here is the tooth died because there was a recurrent caries on this area and the uh, bacteria traveled through the tooth tubules and invaded the pulp. And uh, upon history taking, the restoration was 20 years ago. So of course, shrinkage and uh, shrinkage and uh, recurrence happened. And that's what we get. So definitely this will be uh, this will this will be in uh, root canal. This will be we will do root canal treatment on this station. So let's go to this case. And uh, before uh, before I proceed, so let's check if there are any questions. Let's check if there are any questions. Ah, okay, uh, doctors, you can uh, you can post your comments in the comments section can post your comments in the comment section below so that everyone can uh, see. Uh, I received another PM of questions, so thank you, Doc. Uh, when you <laughs> so the, quest the question was... Sorry, I have to check. So the, the question was is, uh, how, how are you going to isolate curved roots? Okay, so are we going to isolate curved roots? So your curved roots, since they are oriented in this position right here, and uh, of course it's going, this will be another limitation, but what you can examine there is when you look at the actual view of it, it seems like you're looking at the occlusal aspect, and you just have to scan it. So, uh, so you have... Uh, Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go back to that slide. Okay. 
So I go back to that slide. Um, so right here. So when you want to see your uh, when you want to see the curvature of your canal, I, when you want to isolate, you want to visualize the curvature of your canal. What you can what you can do is this. You have to scan it through the HL view. Through the HL view, and what you can do there is uh, since you cannot see the whole canal per se, but you can see if there are any variation or anatomical morphology present. So you have to scan your HL view downwards downwards and that's you will examine so this like in this case again uh, from the orifice to the apex I just scanned it down I just found out three, uh, three canals okay well, let's go to this let's go to this case and uh, again, so our issue here is uh, how can we get a very clear vis visual of this case? And uh, we have here your uh, CBCTs in parallel to your occlusal photograph. So since we're going to deal first with the upper and uh, we're going to manage on the right side, here's what we see. Okay, so your third molar is positioned here. And when we look again on the 3D view, so this is the buccal aspect and this is the lingual aspect. So your buccal aspect here uh, shows that it appears to have three roots. Right? It, appears that it has three roots already. But we have to be sure. And, uh, and you can also visualize and you can also see in the CBCT uh, on this 3D view that your third molar third molar influences your second molar to, to move and uh, to supra erupt locally because when your third molar bumps that uh, convexity on that area convexity on that area it tends to bump your uh, second molar and influences it to erupt and move locally so that could be uh, this could and this could uh, and this is this could cause your malocclusions if the third molars were not addressed. So I'm going to show you how we isolate your third molars. So we go first uh, on the upper, this third molar in particular. So we go first on the upper, and now we go on the right side. And then we start isolating it again. Just follow the long axis. And what we can see here in the detailed view of the sagittal perspective, we can see here there is there are three roots present. Right? And now we scan that down from apical. So now we can see three uh, three roots at the end. So usually removal of the upper third molars is uh, is a fast procedure. It's a relatively faster procedure compared to the lower. However, some cases like this one, uh, you might have a long, you might, you might, uh, you might spend a lot of time, uh, especially when taking care of the of that small root on the buckle. So here's a detailed view of this one. So like this, okay? So you have three roots, and as we scan here, we played around with it. We can see three roots as well. Okay. So we just have to be careful on this one. And as of sinus approximation, it's really approximating your sinus. It's really approximating your sinus area. So we really need to be very careful when handling this uh, type of case, uh, type of patient. So we cannot be uh, really confident on our skills. So this is a little, it's this, this increases the difficulty. So now let's go to the lower. So the elements of your lower, again, is your uh, your mandibular canal where is it positioned where is it uh, where is it in relation to your tooth could be in front could be behind or it could be here so your cbcts 
for you to localize your uh, mandibular canals, they allow you to do canal tracing. So your canal tracing, it traces your nerve so that you can clearly see, uh, you can clearly see and correlate it to your teeth. So here, it, here's I'm going, I'm going to show you how to do canal tracing. So what we do here is we just have to look for the mental foramen. And all you have to do is like you're chasing, uh, it's like you're chasing jello or you're chasing jelly. And you just have to follow the, follow the, the path of your mandibular canal. Seems pretty hard, right? Uh, and that's your mandibular canal. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of advanced, but because uh, softwares are developing and uh, technology is constantly improving, there is now a simplified version of canal tracing. So this is from another software, and uh, all you have to do is locate the mental foramen of the patient. So your mental foramen is usually located on the premolar area. So you just have to locate the open the metal foramen. Scroll it, scroll it down in your HL view. You can see the line going down, and you can see this image going down. It goes to this part here. So that's your mental foramen. So that is your mental foramen already. So the next thing you'll do is uh yeah. Detect the nerve. And there is a guide here that allows you to detect the nerve. And you just have to find the mental foramen similar to this one here. You just have to click and automatically your nerve is traced. So that's uh, that's how easy nerve, uh, nerve tracing is uh, done now. Okay? So there was this manual and there is this automatic. But this, uh, this automatic tracing still allows you to uh, modify just in case your uh, there, just in case there is uh, some inaccuracies on the representation of your canal. So uh, studies have shown as well that uh, canal tracing is not applicable to all patients because as the patient grows older, canals tend uh, the visual uh, sorry the visual of your canal, the appearance of your canal they tend to they tend to shrink as we age. So when you have patients who are in the geriatrics, uh, in the geriatric area, geriatric region, uh, canal tracing could be a little bit harder on your end. So I suggest on those cases, you have to do it manually. So now let's see if the canal tracing is correct. So those white dots, the, the dots that you see here, these are the areas that you can, uh, that you can manipulate, so meaning you can adjust these areas. So let's check if it follows the canal. So what we have to check is the black circle here. This represents your mandibular canal. Okay. All right. So as you can see here, uh, there is a good follow-up. There's a good follow-through of the canal following the, uh, following the tracing that the uh, computer generated. And... Uh, here. So let's see now how it correlates to our mandibular molars. So our question before is, is it in front, is it behind, or is it smack on the middle? And uh, with our canal tracing, canal tracing here, it suggests that it's located on the lingual. So here, you can see here that your canal is located on the, mega, uh, on the lingual. This is the apical region of your uh, tooth. And this is your the tracing of your canal. So it's located on the lingual. This is the buccal and this is the lingual. Ah, yeah. So let's see if there are any questions before we conclude. Okay. So again, if you have any question, you just have to uh, comment it down below. So I have another question here. Uh, I have another question here is, how do I know if it's on the right, it's on the left? It's on the top, it's on the bottom. Uh, your CBCT scans, your CBCT softwares, they have these indicators. Just for example, this one. What we see here is the right R. So this is the right side of the patient. This is the right side of the patient. 
the letter B means buccal and this is lingual. So definitely this is the buccal side and that is the lingual side. So that's how orientation uh, is uh, set in your CBCT uh, scans. Okay? So uh, let's conclude this one. Some takeaway points is utilizing your CBCTs to achieve diagnostic objectives by utilizing the perspectives maximizes the diagnostic parameters that will allow consideration of various treatment options as well as avoid missed opportunities, thus significantly increase your treatment predictability. So your CBCTs, they, uh, they, give, they, give a, they allow you to see all those diagnostic objectives that in your head uh, allows you, it allows you to see it face to face and uh, by utilizing its perspectives. And of course, a clear localization of questionable points in your diagnostic procedure will save you from misdiagnosis as well as further strengthening your patient's confidence in your treatment plan. So those are your takeaway points. A uh, clear localization will, not, uh, will definitely save you from misdiagnosis. And of course, confidence of your patient and your confidence to your treatment plans. Okay, so those are the takeaway points of this lecture. And uh, to end this, dentistry is, uh, is a system. So we have diagnosis, we have treatment plan, and we have treatment delivery. Right? And in digital dentistry, advancements allows us to uh, advancements allows us to make our work as accurate as possible delivering uh, delivering the most predictable outcome that we can offer of course couple it with the good execution and in digital dentistry they we try to cover all the grounds uh, we try to cover everything so from an accurate diagnosis your CBCTs you will now convert it to an accurate treatment plan. So uh, in digital dentistry, there, there are softwares that are merely for diagnosis and there are softwares for uh, just for treatment plans. But today, uh, treatment planning softwares, they are now integrating diagnostic software so that you will, you will, have, uh, you will have easier, uh, easier, easier time in manipulating it or in uh, creating your uh, treatment plans. So, and, and uh, your treatment plans, since they have an accurate, they are accurate right now, uh, digital dentistry turns those accurate treatment plans to an accurate guide so that you can get an accurate treatment delivery. So let me give you an example. So you want to plan an implant. So your implants, your diagnosis, you plan, uh, you assess your possible location of your implant. Now you're sure of where you're going to place your implant, you're going to plan it. You're going to simulate your implant placement, if it's good, what measurements should be done, uh, what size of my implant should be used, and then you design your stent. You design your guides. How should I, re how should I orient my drill? How should I orient everything? That's called fully guided. And uh, with that one, the bridge from your treatment plan to an accurate treatment delivery are your, uh, are your stents, are your surgical guides that allows you to just uh, follow, follow the guide and uh, it makes your treatment simpler, it makes your treatment easier, makes it highly predictable. So in digital dentistry, dentistry we call this sequence, we call these steps as digital workflow. And uh, by following, uh, by, with the follow through of an accurate diagnosis to an accurate treatment plan to an accurate treatment delivery, your digital workflow will influence a predictable treatment outcome. So that, that is, uh, and CBCTs, again, doctors, CBCTs are the, fundamental diagnostic parameter of your digital dentistry. So uh, let's see if we have questions. Okay. So, uh,
Okay. So, the end of our poll, uh, I'm going to update, update update everyone to the end of our poll. Uh, our audience today, so the crowd is uh, more quite familiar and uh, we have we have audiences who does who use CBCTs routinely and we have audience that uh, we have doctors that has CBCTs but they don't know how to manipulate and uh, I mean the secret of uh, the secret of a good uh, the secret of an ease of manipulation is to know the perspectives and for those who are not familiar I hope this lecture uh, gave you a good recognition of seeing your cases uh, in virtual reality and to those who are quite familiar I hope this lecture further improved your uh, further improved your urge to uh, to do three-dimensional imaging techniques and uh, to do this uh, to do this diagnostic parameter to achieve some diagnostic objectives so I'm going to send out another poll but this one is uh, before everyone leaves so I'm going to publish another poll so I just want to know what you think. And uh, again, I am Dr. Paolo Pangilinan. And uh, I'm going to invite everyone that on Saturday, we're going to have uh, two webinars in the morning. It's a very nice discussion, uh, a very nice exchange of ideas between Dr. Jet, Dr. Pao, and Dr. RJ Dulay. Uh, it's all about COVID-19. And we really hope you could join us there as well as episode 4 of botch this saturday uh it's as we uh as we further go to this webinar series the cases becomes more interesting so i don't want you guys to miss out uh, so with that okay so with that i thank you for uh, joining me and uh we hope you guys are safe in uh, this quarantine period. Uh